So we're going to do one more problem, and this one we're going to do a rational function that has a vertical asymptote. And we're going to see how that affects the derivatives, and we're going to do all the exact same steps we did before. No, not at all. Uh, so the order I wrote, like one through eight, step seven is basically plot stuff you d found before. So that's just put that in on step seven. You don't have to do step seven after you finish step six. You can do step seven sort of as you, yeah, as you get your x-axis, intercepts, y intercepts. You can plot all those up immediately. Okay. You don't have to wait until step seven. So they're not, they're there are some steps, like you have to take derivatives before you can get, talk about concavity. Right. So there are, they are written in order on purpose. This, but step seven doesn't have to be done after everything else, basically. Yeah. I, I tried to be smart about the order I wrote them in, but so some of them depend on... Did you make this up? Like, it's either exactly out of the book, or I took some of the stuff and combined some of the stuff uh, from the book. But it's basically find key stuff using derivatives and... Gra yeah, write it down. All right, so we're going to graph and analyze. Our function will go with g of x. So first thing you notice, the domain is not everything, because we can obviously divide by 0 pretty easily. So make sure you write this g function down. I'm going to scroll up to the all, everything I want you to do. So I write the g function down, x squared plus 4 over 2x. And this should all be in your notes, but in case it's not, this is the procedure I want you to do right now. And you can check back with what we did yesterday to see how it looks. So you're going to find step 1 and 2 are pretty much linked together. When you exclude that x value, you're doing it because it's a vertical asymptote as well. So go ahead and get started. Try to do 1 through 8. Get as far as you can. So I'll give you 4 minutes, and then I will try to catch up and pass you. And check with your neighbors, make sure you're on the same uh, step, your derivatives agree, hopefully, so that your critical values agree. So you don't normally get to look at the graph that you're trying to make, yeah. but you can check some stuff. Are you reasonable or are you not as you're going? So one thing I can see, you better not get an x-intercept. And I can see end behavior right here. Not quite horizontal. You can also see concavity very easily, increasing, decreasing. Use this to check your work as you're going.
be two critical values, a positive and a negative x value.
a lot of you on the vertical asymptote probably didn't take a limit to tell me which way it went from the left or the right. So when you say there's vertical asymptote, you need to show at least one of these two. So I just showed using a limit. I did the positive one first. You don't have to do the negative one also. But what this helps in the graph, I saw when I approached zero from the right side, my y value is positive, going towards positive infinity. So when I go to sketch my graph, here's my x equals zero vertical asymptote from the right. I'm going to positive infinity. And then I did limit on the left, and I got negative infinity. So I know right away how it's going to look close to the vertical asymptote. How it's going to approach up on one side, down on the other side. So when we do end behavior, we need to do a limit every time. End behavior, you have to do a limit. Because that's the only way you, in calculus class, you can do end behavior. For end behavior, you can, yeah. Is that writing too small? That's okay. So all you really need from end behavior is up on the right, down on the left. This particular one, because the numerator wins by only one degree, this is a diagonal or a slant asymptote. You don't have to write that down. I will just take, you could just correctly say down on the left, up on the right. That would be full points. But I'm going to try to grab this one a little more accurately. So when the numerator wins by exactly one degree, it looks like a line. Not a flat line, not a horizontal line, but a line that down on the left, up on the right. And you can say it approaches exactly like this on the left and the right. So either way is OK. We're going to get a slightly more accurate graph because we're paying attention to how it approaches infinity. If the numerator wins by two or more, then it's going to look like it's going to have these curved up to infinity or negative, negative infinity. So that is end behavior number two. Derivatives number three. Two. That was also two. All right. Derivatives. First derivative questions. Uh, would you take out a two? Yeah, I can factor a two and then cancel a two on the four. So those twos cancel. We're 
we're going to use that last g prime to get g double prime. So you want to get the simplest one you can. Yes, it sure would be. So we got no X cubes. Does that look okay? She double prime questions. So one thing to notice, no matter how many derivatives you take, you're still going to get a vertical asymptote at the exact same x value you had before. So vertical asymptotes do not disappear, no matter how many derivatives you take. Now, the power on the denominator will keep increasing, but still going to have x to some power in the denominator, no matter how many derivatives you take. I say physics, the so if you have position, derivatives, velocity, the second derivative is acceleration, no. Yeah, velocity, acceleration, jerk. I don't know what comes next, but probably three in most cases is probably about the furthest you need to go. At least in the physics world, that's as far as you go. I think most of the economics problems I've seen, you really only look at first derivatives, where uh, you're just talking about rates of change. Uh, what happens if I build one more unit or one less unit, something like that? If you were in economics, you'd look at the second derivative. You would talk about how what's the effect of increasing something. So you're looking at more in depth into the rate of change. So there may be times where you take a second derivative in economics, but that's a better question for your economics professor. But two or three. I think two or three is pretty reasonable. Now two tells you how the slope is changing, or how the rate of change is changing. So that can certainly be useful. All right, so that is step three. Step four is critical points. So one thing you should notice, this process taking time. This is going to be on a quiz, so you don't want to take forever on it. So make sure you can do this process relatively qu quickly. I'll try to give you a question that's not too hard, and I won't make you talk while you do it. So. Just make sure your speed, you get to a reasonable speed. All right, step four, set g prime of x equal to zero. So we're finding crit points. So do not set g double prime equal to zero, g regular prime equal to zero. All right, fractions suck. Get that denominator out. So multiply by 2x squared. Or you could just say fraction is zero when the numerator is zero. Denominator doesn't affect when a fraction is zero. All right, x equals plus or minus two. So we have to classify each one. So we got critical x values. Let's get the y values to go along with them. So we're going to g both of these. Oh, never mind. 
So it, it was x to the fourth, yeah. All right, g of negative two, wherever g, oh, I have it on my paper. So we got negative two squared plus four. Divided by two, negative two. So that's eight over negative four, negative two. Sometimes you'll get the same y value as you have for x. That's just coincidence here. Now we're gonna g regular two. Eight fourths, which is regular two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so how do you know where to plug it into? Should I plug it into G, G prime, or G double prime? Well, what would I get if I plugged 2 and negative 2 into G prime? Zero. zero. That's where they came from. So that will definitely give us zero. I will plug them into G double prime, but the information I get out of G double prime versus G is very different. So. This tells me where they are in the graph. This doesn't tell me if they're local mins, max, or inflection points. They're one, I know they're one of the three because the slope is flat. I don't know if it's uh, local min, local max, or sort of halfway between. All right, so we're, we figured out the y values, so we g'd the original g. So we're going to use g double prime to find concavity. So we found the points with g prime, or found the x values with g prime, found the y values with the regular g, and now we're finding concavity with g double prime. So we're using all three. All right, use g double prime to find concavity, g double prime of, make sure you're plugging in your x value. Don't plug in your y value, that won't make any sense. They're not usually going to be the same. Very coincidental. So I also did this horizontally separated. So I have negative 2 on one side, positive 2 on the other. So I'm keeping things in columns. So it's pretty easy to see what's going with what. So on the left side, I got. So I just got my negative 2 on the left and positive 2 on the right. So everything I do to negative 2 is on the left and positive 2 be on the right. Was that not? I'm just, yeah, I'm just keeping it organized, basically. I'm doing the same process, just for different numbers. And if I had 3 or 4, I would just put another one over here. Yeah, I have infinite paper. Uh, you actually get infinite paper, too, if you need more. I always have more. So don't be shy. Paper grows on trees. All right, g double prime negative two is what, four over negative two cubed. Now I don't care about the exact number. I care is a positive or negative. So negative cubed is negative, and there's a positive on top. So this is less than zero. So I just want a positive or negative. So negative frowny face. Negative does not mean Minimum, negative means frowny face. So that is a maximum right there. So local max at negative 2, negative 2. So any questions on that classification right there? G double prime positive 2. Now, I don't care about the exact value, but I can see everything's positive, so greater than zero. So that's happy face right there, which is a local minimum. So I'm done classifying right there. All right, increasing, decreasing intervals. I'm going to make a chart here. Well, we'll do make the chart at the end, actually. So we're going to look at increasing
So I want to know when g prime is greater than 0. This one is a little bit tougher because I also have vertical asymptote to worry about. So when I make my sign graph, not only do I have x-intercepts, but I have vertical asymptote that I have to pay attention to is the sign changing. So we're going to make a sign graph. We said negative 2 and positive 2. We also had a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. So there's really our real number line is broken into four parts. So there's two places where it's zero, but you cannot forget about vertical asymptotes. So from here, we can plug in values. Remember, we want g prime right here, which was somewhere x squared minus 4 over 2x squared. So let's go ahead and plug in positive 1. So I will switch the blue marker, go positive 1, g prime of 1. We have 1 minus 4 over 2, less than 0. So this whole part is negative right there. You can plug in three other x values and figure out positive or negative. I'm not going to do that. That part, that, w that way of doing things is absolutely fine. I'm going to instead look at my g prime function and decide, is this a cross or a bounce x-intercept? So is x equal 2 across or a bounce x-intercept. You can really... Uh, you look at... These are both to the first power odd. So if they're odd, it's a cross. And this was from pre-calculus 1 class. So pre-calculus 1 was beers ago for all of us. So, And if you came from calculator world, it could have been infinity ago, because you may never have done this. So you can plug in x values if you want to. I'm doing it by avoiding x values. All right, so at 2, we have a cross x-intercept. So we go from being negative to positive. So I know plus right here. So I'm going to cross at that x-intercept. You can also plug in 3 and get the exact same information by plugging in 3. Vertical asymptote, x equals 0. That's in the denominator right down here. Cross or bounce? So it's degree 2, so it's going to be a bounce. So that's negative, negative again. So bounce means you're not changing. Cross means you're changing sign. And then negative 2 is that factor. Oops, not true. That factor, and that's to the first power, so that's a cross. So we're going to cross change signs. So you can. Now, we're graphing the sign of the slope or the sign of the derivative. Right. So what we're going to do is turn this chart into plus means increasing. Oh, it's too thin. Plus means the original function is in increasing. Minus means decreasing. We're going to. Right. So, I mean, when you could, just by looking at that, you kind of know it goes like this. So I could draw end behavior and say, it's going this way. Yeah. Well, I don't know how it, uh, it may be going, it may be curved like this also. But I can say it's going up on the right. And it's a little weird because when I look to the left, it's going down to the left, which is increasing. You don't want to look at the arrow. The way the arrow is pointing is going to mess you up. Right. So you want to say, oh, when I go to the left, it's downwards. So yes, you can get your end behavior. And the idea is you're going to do the same th similar things and getting similar results as you go. So what you get later on, you can go back and check, was my end behavior correct also? Okay. 
All right, so that's increasing, decreasing. Let's just write out the results now. Increasing on the positives, so that's minus infinity, minus two, union to infinity, and decreasing. Now you cannot go negative two to two. What's wrong with saying that? So a vertical asymptote in between. So you, zeros cannot be in any of these intervals ever. So we have to break it across zero. So I gotta take zero out of there. All right, we got increasing, decreasing. And now we're gonna do the same thing for G double prime, which is step six. These are four over x cubed. All right, we know exactly the only place that this has anything happening, which is x equals zero, there's vertical asymptote. Other than that, it's pretty boring. So without doing much work, if x is negative, whole thing's negative. If x is positive, whole thing's positive. So that sign graph's pretty easy to write. Don't need to go into more detail. Just pick any negative one, positive one, you're good to go. So concave up and down. We're just gonna write CCU. And that is zero to infinity. And concave down. If you want, you could write CC with an up arrow. No, that's not good. We'll kind of up and down, just write it out like that. Zero, all right. So we got concavity, up and down. You could, you could do symbols like that. That's what it means, concave up and down. All right, we are ready to start sketching the graph. What I'm gonna do is build a big table. So G prime told us increase and decreasing. So G prime said increasing here and increasing here. And we're gonna split it like this, decreasing, decreasing. So that's what G prime told me right there. G double prime told me different information. G double prime said concave up zero to, whoa zero to infinity, so concave up like this, and concave down over here. So this is the information G double prime told me. So any questions about filling out this table right here? All I did was just repeated the information, but in a visual way. So I can easily see how things are bending and if we should be going up or down, increasing or decreasing. So now we're going to sketch out the full graph. So we're gonna start with plotting the easy stuff, the obvious stuff. So plot key stuff. So we definitely need two and negative two. Those are our, we got no x-intercepts. Those are our mins and maxes. Your vertical vertical and our, yeah, our vertical asymptote too. So we got two, two, negative two, negative two, vertical asymptote. Don't really need that, we'll just write x equals zero vertical asymptote. I also know this is a local min, 
and that's the local max. So I can draw a little bit of how it's going to look right there. So I know around there, every other point is going to be a little bit bigger. I think that's about all that I can draw. Really didn't get any other information. There's no intercepts, no. How do I know there's no y-intercept? So y-intercept, you take zero and you plug it in. But zero is not in the domain. So we get no y-intercept right there. So y-intercept's out. So we saw that as soon as our vertical asymptote was at the y-axis or they went through the origin. Um, do we have a graph, like, graph or graph paper for the quiz? Yeah. yeah. All right, so let's start using. This is going to heavily rely on this table right here. There's not very many uh, other pieces of information to go on. Let's do the, let's go from negative infinity to the right. So go from, from the left to the right. So I'm going to start to the left of negative 2, so I want increasing and concave down. So two things, increasing, concave down, and our end behavior, let me re rewrite that. Y equals 1 half X. So there's the y equals 1 half x line. So I need to, from this point, I need to get close to this slanted line. I need to be decreasing and concave down. That is not so difficult to do. So decreasing, concave down. It's going to look like this. Go. I said decreasing, increasing concave down. Increasing always hurts the brain if there's an arrow. So put your arrow at the very end. It's also weird to think about negative wall. Right? So there's concave down, it's bending downwards, and it is increasing. So just think going to the right is increasing. All right, we are still concave down, but we're going to be decreasing from 2 to 0. So concave down and in decreasing from negative 2 to 0. So concave down, decreasing, it's going to make us approach the vertical asymptote like that. Still concave down, but now we're decreasing. So any questions on that part of the graph? Yeah, I got so <clears throat> I put it in my handy dandy, and it shows that uh, that it's going closer and closer to y equals zero instead of like. Are you sure? Well, according to that. So, but you might be right. <laughs> so it's not going quickly to negative infinity, but is going to negative. And if we scroll out further. If you scroll really far, you see, oh, that's a straight line. I see. So it's not going to negative <laughs> infinity quickly. It's going negative infinity along that diagonal line. Gotcha. And that's because the numerator won by exactly one degree. If it won by two degrees, it would slant down quite a bit more. So do we have to find the way this one half x for the behavior? Nope. My graph would look almost the same. Maybe I would have curved it more like that without that information but it wouldn't change the graph very much at all. It's still going to be increasing and concave down. You might, your concavity would be less accurate. But what shouldn't happen is you shouldn't be going like that because that's going to have the wrong end behavior, it's going to have the wrong concavity, and it's going to be decreasing. Right, and also when you have another local minimum. Yeah, you have another local, it, that certainly wouldn't be happening. Yep. I, I get why we're doing this, but would it be effective to just use the clueless method and just plot the key points and see what would happen and uh, on each side? But so, like, you could kind of get a basic idea within yeah, seven or eight points. You can, but what you won't see is, well, you won't know there's local min or max if you don't use calculus. 
Right. Which, so do step one or two, one, two, three. Do you have to do concavity and increasing and decreasing? You can fill a lot of that stuff in, especially if you know local mins and maxes. So you can have a pretty good graph without doing five and six. Okay. You won't get a full you won't get full points if you don't do five and six. But the more steps you do, the more accurate your graph could be. So we're sort of doing every step we can using calculus tools. All right. So we're going to use this point now. And we're going to go to the left, so 0 to 2 are the x values we're going to look at. 0 to 2, we have decreasing and concave up. So it might feel like this is decreasing. What's wrong with that? Across the x-axis. Yeah, there's a lot of problems. Across the x-axis, concave down. It's also not decreasing because I'm going backwards. So be careful when you go backwards, this is decreasing. But just look at what you wrote and then go to the right and you'll say, oh, it's, it's uh, certainly decreasing. If I look, when I go to the right, it goes down. So that's concave up, decreasing. Now, what changes at two? I go from decreasing to increasing, which makes sense. That's a minimum. I better start increasing after that. Now I increase and concave up, and I have to approach this y equals 1 half x. So just do your best to approach that line and keep it concave up and increasing. All right, that is our graph right there. So when we take our quiz, is that going to be the only thing on the quiz? It's just this big graph thing, hopefully. Plus taking two derivatives. Right. Classifying like your steps, but like it's not going to be like chapter four plus some other topic. It's related rates and this? No, okay. that'd be too much for a quiz. Really, that's good. So this will probably be your longest quiz of the quarter. <coughs> so we can shift over. With just one question. Pretty much, yeah. So this is zoomed out way too far. It's really good for end behavior. You see what the end behavior looks like at this zoom level. You see the vertical asymptote and the end behavior very clearly. Uh-oh. Let's get to a zoom level with more useful information. There we go. So if I do your quiz tomorrow, it'll be probably related rates. If I do your quiz Friday, it could be graphing. Or related rates. All right, so this graph is relatively close to the one that we just looked at on our paper. So you're going to find that if you graph carefully and correctly, you're going to get something pretty close to what a graphing utility would, would give you. You better get your concavity right. So maybe your graph curls up a little bit too much, but it should, the concavity should still match on your graph. There are some practice graphing problems in your book. Plenty of practice graphing problems in your book. I think they sketch the graphs out for the odd ones, but Desmos and Fooplot are really good to graph it out, and they let you move around, zoom in, zoom out, all that stuff.